Hi, welcome to Gretsch Generations. I'm Vinny Kaliuta, and we're going to have a great episode today with my dear friend and colleague, Keith Carlock. So I'll be introducing him in a moment here. And um, this is really, really great. And we're really, really happy to be talking about, about just our endeavors and about, uh, and about Gretsch drums. And one thing I will say is that I'm um, not only am I proud to be a, a, uh, a veteran Gretsch artist and endorser, but I'm, I'm proud to be a stable mate uh, with my dear friend, Keith Carlock. So without further ado, here's Keith. Hey, Vinny. Hey, how are you, Keith? I'm good, so good to see you. Good to so, see you too. Um, so cool to do this with you. And uh, thanks to our beloved Gretsch drums, Jules and Andrew for putting this together, inviting us to do this. Yeah. This is really cool, man. So good to see you. It's great to see you too, man. Even virtually, because we're all so sequestered now. So I know. Better so than nothing, man. So what have you been up to during this crazy downtime pause we're experiencing? The world coming to an end and all that. <laughs> Just you know, kind of bitching and moaning about it, basically. <laughs> That's easy to do. <laughs> yeah, and being on pins and needles and. Uh, Having adrenal fatigue, just not knowing, you know, from the uncertainty. I mean, I mean, I'm just sort of, um, yeah, you know, I, I think that that, you know, the carrot has been going back and forth, and many of us have been just kind of watching it unfold and just waiting for things to open up, and then they would open and then close and open and close. And so, for me, you know, what I had done. Um, it's basically, you know, I sort of watched this whole thing unfold with incredulity. <laughs> and that's my 29 cent word for this morning. Coffee's just starting to kick in. So the vocabulary is, you know, but <laughs> so, so, so really, and, you know, really, and, 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 you know, also I've sort of, we've all been sort of thinking, okay, what does this mean? And what's happening? And we saw, the reactions and, and the behavior of, of, of everybody in the first few months, especially kind of freaking out and how people adapted to it. I mean, this is a whole other kind of um, episode. I mean, I could, I could talk about that question for, for an hour in, in and of itself, you know? So, so basically, but, but, but in a nutshell, I just sort of went, okay, well, when are we going to be working again? And um, <clears throat> not just for the idea of the commerce and for the work, but, right. but just, be engaged again, you know, mm -hmm. and, and be active and be immersed in it. So, cause it's what we do is an immersive thing. Yeah. So, so it, it has to be, you know, it's like, and, this and, is and, and then things started happening and then they stopped. And so, and, and many of us, many of us worked from home uh, and, and that's okay too. And there's, that's all good. And, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you might echo this. We talked about this recently, but I, I like staying at home and I like being able to travel though when I feel like traveling. So, you know, like for recreational travel and, and that's not possible right now, but, but I got a chance to work more from home and, uh, and that was nice too, because it's just a, a different kind of experience and it, it gave me the chance to um, work differently and be at home, even though I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've had that capability and have been doing that for at least 25 years. Yeah. Um, at least I, I just never advertised it. I just sort of kept. Yeah. I wasn't myself. sure if you did that from home or not since like, since it was able to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know, like 1990 or something. I mean, you know what I mean? 1993 yeah. okay. or something is when I kind of jumped in and uh, maybe late 80. And so, you know, I changed the systems that I used several times and now it's, 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 it's so much easier to do it. I had to have racks of stuff doing it, but, but, but really you, you don't really need that much stuff anymore. You, I mean, everything is so software based. Yeah. And, and I still see people who, you know, will, will kind of go, Hey, look at this, look at this gear I just bought, you know, and they, and they have these racks of stuff of, uh, you know, and, and they'll say, they'll say, well, it sounds a little better, you know, I a beat it and, uh, or, you know, it, this, that, or the other thing is, you know, it takes the load off the mix bus in the computer. Meanwhile, I talked to world-class engineers, right. That I would have sworn would be analog 
holdouts. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple of them, and I'm I'm, I'm not going to speak for them and name names, but I could. And who are saying, "Oh, I sold all that stuff, man." I said, "You mean you sold your your dangerous and mixed butt?" Yeah, you know. And they're like, "I'm in the box, baby." Yeah. You know? Wow. You it's know? And, uh, well, I mean, it's possible now. Like, yeah. You know, like for example, <clears throat> Universal Audio makes the, the the Apollo range of interfaces, right? I use those actually. So do I. I'm a yeah. huge UA fan, and I mean, I got rid of my Pro Tools stuff. When they changed the card slots and and they started all that stuff, I just went, no, I can't do this. I'm not going to spend all that money again. I'm just, just going to wait. A few years later, they came out with that, and it was revelatory. And, and and you know, it's just, to me, it's like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Because, first of all, it does all the, the processing. It takes the does the heavy lifting, takes it off the computer. So it's mm-hmm. got all these processors in it. And then it processes the plugins as well, which are outstanding. They yeah. sound amazing. And so their Neve stuff. Do you, yeah, all you that, I yeah. have real Neve preamps, but but you know, I, I've used those and, and I'm like, okay, really good. But so it's I mean, really, you just need, you know, some some I mean, if you have one of the Apollos that has analog inputs, you could just use that in a laptop, you know, mm-hmm. or, or or an iMac. And so so times have changed a lot, and it's afforded a lot of people. The ability to do that. I mean, well, I think one of the things though that's interesting <clears throat> is that it's it's the wild, wild west because there's no there's no wage scale for it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, guys like us, if people want us to do things because of who we are, then they'll hire us. Um, you know, based on several factors that warrant hiring us. And but 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 I think. A lot of times you get this thing now where everybody and their uncle are coming out of the woodwork on social media going, I'll play on your record for $5. Yeah, you know? right. And so <laughs> what happens to that, you know, supply and demand? Yeah, exactly. So so, so it's a little problematic, but but at the same time, it affords a lot of people the opportunity to do stuff that, that they they couldn't do before. So, I mean, that's yeah. the long story for me. And, um, and what about you? How, how have you been navigating this whole quagmire you know for the past 18 months yeah. uh well you know when i realized it was going to be more than a few months you know when it was like okay this could this really could be at least a year or two that we're we're, we're going to be home you know when i realized yeah. that and got through the initial depression of it um and just all the disconnection you know with what i you know what we do and what we're used to doing yeah um moving around so much. And anyway, I just had to like find the positive in there somewhere. And and what's been great is being home with my family and the kids and being a part of their daily routines and taking them to school and all the activities I would have missed, you know, so that's all really valuable. They're young. So it's like, it's a great time to be home, you know, so that's been really, really cool. Um, and I've loved that. Uh, I've embraced it, you know. Um, and then I, I never had the home studio set up until now. This this allowed me the time to finally do it. I've been talking about it for years. Yeah. I always, I usually we just have to go rent a place, you know, rent a studio or use a friend's place. But now I ha- I have the whole setup. I got two of those Apollo um, X eight Ps, the eight channel ones. You know, have all the plugins involved. It, they're great, sound great. Oh, so that's what I've been doing. I mean, at least I've been staying busy playing you know, doing sessions from home. Um, that's kept me kind of sane through it all. Um, and just kind of learning about stuff that I, I, I've been putting off, just getting into other things, reading things that I haven't, you know, been able to do. Just just finding things to do with myself, you know, has been kind of fun. I've tried to find the positive because it's so easy to go dark, you know? Oh, I know that. <laughs> Well, I think you but, got a taste of that yesterday when we did this little sound check. Oh, <laughs> from me. But I, it was I funny get it. Got to I, that. It was fun. <laughs> I get it, man. I get it. It's, it's easy to go there, and man, um, yeah, it's so weird feeling so disconnected from from it all. Yeah, you know? I mean, I've just recently started playing some gigs out, mm-hmm. and it's been strange, but really great, just to play a set of music again. You know, and, to, you. and try to get into that zone, try to get there again. I mean, it's slowly coming back, but it's it's strange, you know. 
Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. The last, the last actual live performance I did was March fifth, twenty twenty. Mm. But I'll tell you what, it was a great one, a great way to go go out yeah. and live gigs. I mean, if that was the last gig that I ever did, did I could say, okay, I'll take that. You know, I mean, hopefully it won't be, you know, but but it was, I remember it, it was Disney Hall with the Herbie Hancock group and the LA Phil with Dudamel conducting, who, Ooh, wow. you know, that guy is the fifth Beatle. He, I mean, I've worked with several conductors, but this guy... He so gets it. He so gets what it's like to navigate with a have a rhythm section with an orchestra and to just sort of glue that together. And he, he knows when to let the drummer guide it as well. Mm. <clears throat> and he'll dance with you. So he, it's, we're like kind of, kind of co-pilots with this. It's a really amazing experience, and you can feel it right away. And the energy you feel when you're playing live, you know, that you – it's like we can all do this from home, and, and all of it's very valid, but – that kind of energy you get when it's like you're playing and you're driving the time, but interacting with, with different personalities who, you know, that it, it's, 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 how can I say this? There's not exactly this sort of inertia and it's this weird kind of thing where there's so many, uh, the, the way that you feel the, the push pull in in microscopic sort of time elements, you know, and you, you feel the dialogue happen between everybody, and it's it's a different feeling. It is a different sense, visceral sense that you get, and a visceral sense of responsibility than just playing along with a track that's static. I mean, I, mm. you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's a whole different kind of kind of feeling. So, and 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 it's a very valuable one, and that's how we learned. And and what we're used to, which I'm I'm glad for that. I, I have to say I'm I really am. I think it's invaluable to be able to do that. But it's at the core of us being able to communicate as human beings. Yeah, I miss feeling that that thing, you know, where you break a sweat and you you you're interacting, you're you're you know you're improvising, you're you're reacting to what's going on, and and I that part of my brain has been just sitting there dead for so long, you know, oh, it's so nice to finally feel that a little bit again. So, yeah. I, yeah. Um, but, and that, that makes me think of, you know, what has inspired me. Um, and I, I, I want to maybe talk about my first impression. I'm looking at our segments here um, of when I first heard you play, um, which I remember getting a VHS tape. Uh, it may have been from a teacher at the time or a friend of uh, Zildjian Day in New York, 1984. And it was, uh, it was you, Billy Cobham, Gad, um, I think Alex Acuna and Tommy Campbell on the bill. Bunch of hacks, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. It, it blew my mind. And wow. I watched, uh, I think there might be some video of that Jules, but, uh, I watched this thing of you over and over and over. I wore it out. I wore out the tape. Oh wow. Um, because I had just never heard, I'd never heard anything like it. Um, I'm gonna go back in time. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Red Chuck. Oh man, I wore that out. Wow. <laughs> it's just incredible. I mean, the 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 ideas and the flow of it, I, I, it just hit me and it, I, I'd never heard anything like that. Um, and to me, it, it, it was like such a fresh take on drumming. Like I had never heard, like the ideas that you have, the way that you orchestrate those ideas around the drums is just so unique to you. Um, just incredible, just brilliant, the way that you, 
it, the flow. It just seems like you could do anything. You could just kind of go. Um, your rhythmic vocabulary is so deep. I mean, you're just you're you're drawing from some other worldly thing, man. And it's 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 really really incredible. <laughs> and and that was my first taste of it. And then I remember going to. Um, it might have been my first year in college. I went to a PASIC. Um, I was in the drum line at the time and we were doing uh, competitions there. And luckily you were there, you were on the bills, 1989. I don't know if it was Philly or Nashville, it was one of the two. Um, oh, and I remember. Do PASIC. you remember? Yes, I remember that PASIC, yeah. 80, 89, you came out and slayed us. You basically, you know, tore our heads off, played about 45, 50 minutes, you know, of just playing. You didn't, you didn't pause. And it was the most brilliant drumming I'd ever heard. And, and wow. all of us had our jaws to the floor and you, you, you finish and you're like, uh, you know, thank you. Any questions, you know? And I thought, I thought that was amazing because for me, I, I was never one of those guys that, that wants a clinician to, to talk and analyze everything. I, I learned from hearing and watching, you know, and, and someone like you just got up there and, and basically blew our heads off. Oh. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> oh, and, then, and, you know, and I, it just, it's this lasting impression, you know. And then it was like, okay, I caught, I caught the Vinnie bug. Now I got to go out and find everything you, you played on. And, and that's when I discovered just there's so many but i just want to mention a few that really was a big impact for me one of them was uh and there's also a video of it out there too uh you and uh chick korea god rest his soul uh patachuchi playing uh live at the blue note tokyo mm -hmm. which um that completely blew me away i've always been a fan of how you play straight ahead well, because you. because it's so fresh and and there's no cliche like, you know, I love the old school bebop language. I love all that stuff. But you you took you took it to another level. I mean, you you did it your way, uh, and you do it your way. Um, and it, it's just so beautiful how just how you and just incredible, incredible playing and just the, the chemistry between you guys was just it's it just unbelievable on fire. Um but you just have your own language and you, you took it somewhere. You took it to another place. And, uh, and I just think that's, it's just so inspiring, you know? And then the next one was an Alan Holdsworth record called secrets. So you got the straight ahead thing with chick. And then, and then this was like a whole other thing going on where it just felt like you guys were basically just improvising and rolling tape, which, you know, I'm sure there was composed things going on, but it just felt like, you know, seeing that other side of it was basically that. Yeah, just rolling with yeah, with some just little charts cues and stuff. Had, uh, yeah, just had pushes and bar lines. So that 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 was another one that blew me away. So uh, those two records, you know, anybody out there that doesn't know about those, you got to check them out. Um, awesome. And then and then you know and then of course the Sting band that you were involved in uh, you know 10 summoners tales that was a huge one that's that's a classic now um what was the other one mercury falling was great um i'm gonna start blushing it. now i'm gonna tell you that i'm about to blush what <laughs> i'm gonna blush now <laughs> oh, oh come on man no, but it's it, because because i think I, that i really can't thank you enough for those accolades keith because Coming from you it really, really means a lot. And um, I mean, for various reasons, just the level of player that you are and the depth of your understanding. So so to me, it's it's like a vote of confidence and it validates. It really does. I, I can't thank you enough, man. Really. Oh, man. It's just. Well, I um, can't. I can't thank you enough for all the inspiration. I, I'm sure I, I speak for many, many, many drummers out there that would love to tell you that. So, uh, <laughs> well, so I, I hope so. As long, if I've. You know, lifted people up and and inspired people. Uh, and I've done my job, you know, and communicated the music. And and it's like, you know, I I, I don't even think people ask me things like, well, <clears throat> what is um, what's your favorite record that you ever played on? Your favorite this, your favorite that. It's like, 
I mean, I'm not, and I say this with humility, just try to keep this in context that I've done so much stuff. And mm-hmm. I, it got to the point where I, I could pick out highlights for sure. I can't single out one thing. And, and I kind of go into things now with, with an open book, you know, like I just a blank slate, everything, I treat everything equally. And, um, and, and so, yeah. So, so I think that that's an important mindset, but, but yeah. I mean, I have, you know, my impressions of you as well, because, you know, speaking of individuality, this is the one thing that struck me really, really just, it, it really hit me hard when I first heard you, you know, and I'm trying to remember exactly when the first time was, um, you know, it was hearing about you with Wayne Krantz, I think. And and Oz Noy, and because because I know you were working with Wayne a lot in New York, and and then I was reading and hearing things about you because I think you were doing stuff with Steely Dan, and um, and 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 Fagan and Becker were saying that, you know, he's got this he's got this whole thing, like he's from the South and it's this swampy thing and you could feel it because he's from there, and they were describing <laughs> you, and then I heard you and I thought, man. Okay, now we have another breakthrough guy. Hmm. A breakthrough guy who because it seems like like it it's it, it happens sometimes generationally, you know. And and now, you know, in my opinion and and I say this I try to say this as objectively as possible, um I find it ironic that with the amount of information that's passing that's that's being disseminated everywhere instantly and that people can learn from and model uh i see a lot of homogeneity um and so you know when i heard you there was a whole bunch of things that 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 crossed through my mind at once um as well as a visceral feeling and i think the most important thing is that i got a feeling from you whereby with all the other things that I could describe, the one thing is, is that the feel of what you do hit me in the gut. Like it was so mm. convincing the the groove, no matter what you played and no matter what you did, the groove never stopped. And it was convincing and deep through everything. It was never like it got lost through a fill it was just as deep and just as convincing and everything was, and, and I thought, and I heard things and I went, wow, listen to that bass drum sound. You mm. get all this tone, but it's got punch and you know, you're executing all these things on a bass drum like that. That's kind of open, which has to be more difficult to do because if people aren't used to playing that way. You know, if they bury the beater, it's going to buzz and kill the sound of the head. Right. So it takes a lot of bass drum chops to do that. And and then, and I thought, wow, you sound so clean. You know, I heard you playing on stuff with Wayne, and, and I heard you playing on stuff with Oz, and and, mm. uh, and the recordings that you did with Oz Noy um, were, were just astonishing to me because, you know, I'm thinking, wow, this guy is so clean. Wow, man. But his groove is so, so viscerally great there's there's grease in there but 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 he's got control you know and 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 the doubles were so smooth and open and and it's like very very accurate but but with with mojo you know and 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 with and with your own kind of sound and identity i just saw it i went there's a breakthrough this guy is is coming through saying uh, you got a new there's a new guy on the block now and and he's very recognizable you know? Oh man! What? Well, yeah, that and, that means a lot. Thank you so much, no, man. But, but I'll tell you what, Keith, <laughs> you know, you know, and it's here's the here's the clincher though, is to have that identity, you know, and uh, and and it can be stylized or whatever, but but you still, when when you're playing the music, it's still the music is you're transparent enough to sort of, you know what I mean, fit in with the music, whatever you're playing, and still your your own identity comes out without without it stepping on 
whatever you're trying to make the music represent. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And so, so the odds thing was was um, you know, I, there's there's probably a clip of that um, that that we have here, and uh, it's pretty remarkable. Let's check it out. Uh oh. Will baby. Yeah. Yeah, it was just so just open and deliberate and beautiful. Oh, man. Oh, fantastic. Trying to do my Elvin thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, man. It's your key thing. <laughs> but man, like was, thank you so much. That that means everything coming from you. Uh and the but, Steely Dan stuff too. You know, which is like, I mean, you're a staple of that, of that now. And you know. I got to share a little bit of that with you on know, the two against nature thing where I ended up on a track. Yeah. And you're all, you're all over that stuff. And so I, so I, you know, got a taste to see what they're like, but you're all over that stuff and then doing it live and, and, uh, and just killing it. You know, I, I mean, to yeah, be it's able, really been, it's really been fun, man. Wait, yeah, such a, I remember a nice... when you were telling me about that when, and, yeah. and then, and then you came in when I left to, 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 to hand you the baton to do the sting tour. That's when we first met. Exactly. It's, it was uh, 2003. and uh, In England. Yep, at, 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 his, at Sting's home outside of London. Yeah. You, got, you guys were rehearsing. I got to just be a fly on the wall and see how you guys work together. And it, that was incredible, man. Yeah, we what, got to hang out for like a week and sort of break bread together. And That was the best part. You and I got, got to hang, and it was so much fun, man. I, yeah. I'll always remember that very fondly because it was so much fun. Same and here. uh it was great and uh <laughs> yeah i was happy to take the baton i know you wanted to um stay home because you were working like crazy in la and probably didn't want to go on the road and um yeah i had it, some other things going on that were yeah you know. but uh so anyway it was it was an honor to 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 try to take that on <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so yeah. uh so yeah man we just had the best time i'll always remember that and i remember you were you were leaving I think I was there for like four or five days and, and you were going straight from London to uh, Boston to honor Gad at the, you know, the, I don't know if it was a Zildjian event right. or American do you remember? Drummers Achievement Awards. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that was a while ago, but you sounded really so great was. on that. Oh man. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, cause I remember getting there and uh I, I showed up and I was so jet lagged and I had to uh, wait until like, I don't know, 11 hours or something. It was a long time before I was actually going to go on. And, and it was all I could do to stay awake. I don't even remember how much coffee I drank, but <laughs> it kind of me being overseas for a while too. Yeah. Just right. Land the plane and go to the Berkeley performance center and then hang out for eight hours, you know, Oof, rehearse. Yeah. 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 But I mean, speaking of the road, it's like, I mean, I know we all have favorite road stories and, and I mean, where do you start with that? You know, I mean, there's a million of them is, is kind of like we have, we have, I can conjure up and I'm sure you can conjure up several, which, yeah. you know, may have to do with various avenues of, 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 of the road. And, you know, you know if, if you mind, I'll, I'll start, I'll just throw a couple out okay. there. Okay. Speaking of sting, you know, um, I remember the, the second gig that I ever did with him. Uh, it was in Chile, and I think that's when Pinochet was still in power. So we get there, and it was it was pretty it was pretty tense because it was very militaristic, and you know, it was a bunch of military around, and and uh, really a kind of strange thing. And we were playing in this huge arena, and uh, so we we played. And I think it was a, I think it was an amnesty. Uh, it had something to do with amnesty again. This concert, mm -hmm. so we're playing, and then um, we played this song called "They Dance Alone," and um, all the the widows uh, of of those who had been who had been murdered, 
you know, mm. because of that regime, came out on stage and um, with with these wooden posts with 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 pictures of of their of uh, of their of their fallen ones. Um, yeah, they lost. Wow. Yeah, and uh, they came out while we we're playing, and the song. It's a slow song, um, and then it breaks into this 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 samba at the end, this kind of double time samba that's supposed to be uplifting. And 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 I'm thinking, and they came out, and I I lost it. I couldn't I couldn't hold it together. Mm. I was I'm trying to play a happy samba like there's light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm seeing these women there, and I'm weeping uncontrollably. Um, so oh, these are these are just moments that stand out in my mind, right? And yeah. that's one of them. And that's the other heavy. one, was, yeah, it was really heavy. And the other one was when I was with Herbie, one of the first gigs I played with Herbie, I think we were in Spain. And, you know, just otherworldly level improvisation, this guy. So, mm. you know. I, I saw you with I, him recently, by the way. It was amazing. Great. Thank you. And so, so I'm playing. So, so we're playing. And you know, he's playing a solo and they're playing, and all of a sudden, I stopped by like four bars, and I'm just cracking up and <laughs> giggling. I had a giggle fit because what he was playing was killing me so hard that I, you know, and then I realized that I stopped playing, and I was like, oh, I'm supposed to be playing, right? And so I <laughs> jumped back in and kept playing. So the gig's over, and then you know, I, I went up to him and I said, man, Herbie, you know, I. And I'm, I'm sorry, man. I just, you know, I, you were killing me so hard, man, that I just, I, I stopped playing. I forgot, you know. And he, <laughs> he, just, he just laughed. And to him, to him, it was nothing. To him, it was like, it was like that was an event. Oh, that's my jazz statement. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. <laughs> I just laid out, you know. <laughs> and then another time I remember we were going somewhere and we got stuck in this big storm uh, on a tour bus, and the bus could barely make it over to uh, go across this little bridge. And we had to, we were on this tour once, and the bus rides were like 21-hour bus rides. I mean, it were nuts. And, mm. and this was an iteration where the band had a whole bunch of people, and Dave Holland was doing it. And there were, it, was, it was like that bus was was stuff like a can of sardines right but we all got along one big happy family but it was trying so we were going through the storm and we barely got over the, the, the this bridge you know without kind of <laughs> falling into the ravine or whatever and the reason that we had to take that route is because someone uh in one of the european borders that we were at refused uh passage because our guitarist Lionel Lueke, Lionel Lueke's passport was from Benin, mm. and so we had to reroute the whole trip because of that. And we all felt so bad for for Lionel that you know that he was. I mean, that's like, I mean, it's just wrong, you know, that he had to go through that. We didn't, you know, we were already used to taking the long trips, but but then it got really treacherous weather wise, and I just remember us us going through that and and. You know, then pulling up to the gig, going straight to the gig, uh, right, right, right in time for sound check and things like that. And right. I mean, there's there's a ton ton of moments that that you know that that I, that I have like that. But those are just a few <laughs> few memorable road stories that 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 I have. So that's amazing. Take it away, Keith. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to think, man. I don't think I can top that. But I, I remember um, there's there's so many that uh, I'm going to blank on now, but. Uh, one that comes to mind is, you know, moving to New York um, and started playing with with Krantz not too long after I moved there. And, and we kind of became this um, regular th Thursday night 55 bar thing, you know, that it, it just became like a, a hang and be started to become a band and we were playing a lot and... Um, and I was feeling really good because we I was able to improvise a lot and and I was just in it. I was really in that band and and uh, you know we did a lot of rehearsing back in those days and sure. co conceptually working out the music and stuff. But um, but everyone, 
you know, that it just seemed like everyone was coming out to those gigs. And, and that's how I, I met Donald and Walter, because they came to hear us play several different times. Um, okay. and, I rem- and I remember when uh, Donald actually sat in with us one night. Will Lee was playing bass that, that night. Um, Tim LaFave was, was usually in the band, but he was out of town or something. Will was playing and um, Donald played Rhodes, learned some of the heads with Wayne oh. and um, came and played. And, and that, was, that was a moment I'll never forget. It was a turning point, but it was also just, you know, I'd maybe, I'd been in New York maybe a year or a year and a half at the most. And, and that was a moment where it's like, okay, if nothing else happens, this is pretty cool, you know? Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah, it was, it was just one of those moments I'll always remember is like, like kind of a pinnacle, like turning point kind of, you know, things started to kind of whatever happen. Yeah. Um, and a- another cool story was that Donald and Walter ended up bringing the, the Krantz band into their studio that they had in, in the Upper East Side at that time called River Sound mm-hmm. to record. They were going to produce a record for, for Wayne's trio. It, it never saw the light of day, but that's kind of how I think, um, uh, you know, I got into their heads for maybe, you know, calling me in to do some studio work so, and later when they were doing their own stuff. So not to interject, no. Keith, because I want you to keep flowing with that. This is a great story, but did, did you guys actually go and record it and it didn't see the light of day or it didn't happen at all? We recorded, and I don't think Wayne wasn't happy with the performances or the or, or what we were getting out of it for some reason. He kind of just, you know, let it go from what I remember a long time ago. But, no. but yeah, <laughs> but it was a great. It was cool because you know I got to I got to know those guys, and no. and, uh, and and it just turned into what it did, you know. But um, mm-hmm. but I've had some great. You know, uh, live moments too. Probably the first time that I played with those guys, I remember I was I was quite nervous, you know, and and then um, and then just the you know it just it just somehow it came together. But but I just remember like, man, this is such a big deal because 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 of the history of this band and and like you know I was this new guy that a lot of people didn't know about, and so I just remember like just the the nervousness I felt and, and, but it came together and it was, it was so great and so much fun. And then I, I let that go. Finally, I just said, okay, I gotta, you know, gotta let that stuff go and, and it's all going to be cool. But um, yeah, that, those are what comes to mind at the moment, but, but yeah, man, it's um, there's a lot of them. I just kind of space and. Yeah, no, that, I know it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to conjure them up, you know, yeah. I know exactly what you mean after a while, you know, they all kind of meld together, but um but but you know we we all have our our stories. I mean I, uh, it's a weird one, man. I, I remember. Uh, I mean that's that's a great. Thanks for for sharing that one. Man. <laughs> that's, that's like I I really I was like following along with that and feeling exactly what you're saying. You know that whole kind of emotional, uh, you know, right? Wow, you know you get all excited, and nervous, and yeah yeah I know exactly what you mean. You know, but but I mean. <laughs> We can go on with road stories forever, but I, I think that, um, well, you know, I mean, and, and we've both done our share of of of, um, of studio work as well. So, so it's like I'm sure we have, you know, a favorite studio tales as well. So, mm. um, I don't know if if you know if you want to impart uh, some of uh, some of yours and 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 uh, take it away, and then I'll see if I can conjure up some. You know. Yeah. Wow. I didn't let's see. Um, let's see, I gotta say, I'm going to have a hard time. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I know, (laughs) right? Yeah. It's like hard to, hard to think of something. Um, I mean, you know, know, go ahead. Why don't you go first and I'll I'll think about it. I'm kind of, so, okay. So I'll, I'll throw a couple in the hat here. Uh, <laughs> so one time I was um got called to do a uh, a recording session uh, uh, with a singer whose name is Alexander O'Neill, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I 
can't remember what studio it was, but I remember um, that the, earlier that day, it was actually, a, the session was at seven o'clock at night, six or seven at night. And earlier that day, I had done like a movie session that was really early because, and, you know, when there was a lot of work going on, um, they would do these movie sessions at eight and nine in the morning, right? And to the mm. point where sometimes they were so early, there'd be 8 a.m. calls that there was a keyboard player here in town in L.A. called Jim Cox, right? He used to have one of his road cases had like a griddle in it, like a, like he could cook. <laughs> you know, he'd show up in his bathrobe and, and like be ready to cook breakfast. And I thought that's a statement because, you know, I thought, man, one of these days I'm going to show up at, you know, in my bathrobe because – you're calling these dates at like eight in the morning and there's LA traffic and I got to get up at five. You know what I mean? It's still daylight. Are you people crazy? It's like, like to try to sit there and, and like at 8 AM and play like you're playing at a club, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> no, you know, not going to happen. Nah, I don't think so. So, so anyway, you know, so I did the session I'm driving home and it wasn't even close to Halloween. It was, um, just, I don't even know. I mean, it was like, I don't know, August or something. So I went past a, a Pico or one of those big boulevards. I went past some costume store and I just pulled over and and just decided to go in because I thought, oh, that's cool. And I saw this Batman outfit. It was, I thought, <laughs> wow, that's, that's, yeah, I'm going to get that. So I bought it and, and uh, I put it in my car and I go home and didn't think much of it. And then, and then I, you know, I got tired and I thought I'm going to take a nap because I'd got up really early. And then all of a sudden I realized that, oh, wow. It's, uh oh, I'm going to be late. Better get dressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What did I do? Yep. You guessed it. So now it's nighttime and I'm driving down the street and I've got this truck at the time, like a Chevy Blazer, and I'm driving. I've got the ears on, the whole bit, the cowl, the mask, the cape, you know? And, you know, people are like <laughs> driving up next to me going, yeah, they're kind of sticking out of their sunroofs going, right on, Batman, yeah. You know, so I get to the studio and I think Cox was on that session. And I get to the studio and John Patitucci was on the session and Booker T was on the session playing organ. Wow. So I show up and I just waltz in. I'm late. And I just walk right in and just stand there fully, full regalia. <laughs> I just stand there. And uh, do they so know it's the you? <laughs> the guys did. And they just looked at me and it was like, yeah, because I was like the drummer on the date, right? And it's like I'm the only one who didn't show up yet. So so it's like, and they just just went, oh man. So <laughs> he looks at me, the artist, and he goes, and he's, and he's standing about six feet away from me, and he looks, and he slowly walks right up to me towards me. And he looks at me right in the face and he goes like this. He looks at me up and down. And I'm standing there, and it's just you know, like, and and then he just goes, yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Batman. I like that. Yeah. And I was Batman the whole session. That's awesome, man. Dating character. Oh. I got one Polaroid of it, you know. This is back before, before. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah but I'm Batman, so, so there, you know. <laughs> and uh, before the yeah. cell phones, before. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, exactly. It's like a, it could have been Superman and going into a phone booth. They still had phone booths, you know. <laughs> so, um, and then and then you know, let's see another one. Of, we were cutting Joe's Garage with Frank. Oh, Zappa. what a great and, record! Yeah, I was going to mention that one too. Oh, right on. <laughs> and that was the first time I met Joe Ciccarelli and worked with Joe Ciccarelli. So, you know, anyway. Was that late 70s? This was, was that... like, uh, I'm, um, yeah, like 78. Well, I moved here in the spring of 78. So 79. It was like, yeah, in there. Okay. Um, and, and, and so uh, we went into the studio um, to record. We, we thought we were recording a single. 
the B side. And we, you know, we went into the village um, recorders and, and then all of a sudden we're still there. It was going to be a few days and then another day and another day. And, um, and I got called to do this project uh, in, 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 in the Bay area. And I, and I, and I kept saying, uh, yeah, I don't know when we're going to be out of here, man. You know, and then another week went by and, you know, it was like, ah, we're still here, man. And so, you know, I bailed on that project. And then all of a sudden we were in there for weeks and, and this whole thing happened um, spontaneously. He made it up as he went along. He made the whole double album up on the spot. And he just, wow. we just stayed in the studio till he was done. It was, it was, I don't know, like a month, you know? And so that was another memorable That's thing incredible. for me. Yeah. Um, really was. And then the whole sort of thing, the secrets was like, where we just uh, went in there and Jimmy Johnson, it was just me and Jimmy and Al and Al, Al, he wasn't playing on it. You know, I remember on city nights, it was just this pad that I think Gary husband had put on there. Cause he wrote it and a click track. And Jimmy just took these little sheets of little note paper, blank paper, and just wrote, you know, bar lines and pushes here and there and time signature. And it was like, there was a click and it's like, okay, go. So we just, that's how he did it, you know? And it, it was almost all of it was first takes, maybe a couple of second takes, but, mm -hmm. but we just went and just hit it and went for broke, you know, but we tried to do it with the sensibility of what the song was going to be about. It's just that, you know, it wasn't like, Oh, you know, a free for all, just do whatever you want. And, you know, bleh, spew, you know, it was like, <laughs> you, you had to have some kind of sensibility of, it just means that we had carte blanche, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, Trusting in our sensibilities, so that was that was a great one, and and then um, you know I think gosh, uh, Jody Mitchell, Wild Things Run Fast, that was memorable. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Really memorable session. I remember it was just the first time we went in to cut that single. It's just just me and Lucather and and um, Larry Klein was there, and um, and then you know we had this we cut this track where she based the lyric on the Corinthians from the Bible and. And I remember, you know, Larry was going to try to redo his bass part because he didn't like the sound after we had cut it. And he tried, he went back in there and it was like, no matter what he did, it just couldn't, he didn't think that it felt, ever felt the same. And I, I just remember just, the, the, there's some really, really memorable moments. That, that's one that, that comes to mind is going in there and recording with her too. And, um, and, and it was just, it was just crazy because I mean, I, you know, I was always like, all these people that I'm mm -hmm. talking about, I was always like huge fans. And for me, it's kind of like, I feel really blessed because I got to, to work with, with most of my heroes. And that's really all I wanted to do, you know, as, as yeah, yeah. play that kind of music and play with them and just, you know, play what, what I, what I grew up with listening that influenced me and, and just play, you know what I mean? Music that I love. Yeah. That, it, that, that formed me. So, and informed me. So that's my studio story. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, you, you, you reminded me of a few things. Um, when you mentioned Larry Klein working with Joni and, and, uh, uh, you know, I got to work with him once when, uh, he produced Walter Becker's circus money record, which was Walter's you solo. Sound amazing on that. Oh man, I'm amazing. I didn't know. Uh, thank you. Oh yeah, that that was um, that was a really fun record. It was great working with Larry and uh, Walter. Wanted to rehearse and and get some groove ideas together. It was kind of had a reggae tinge to it, and and we were listening to some reggae and and just kind of getting ideas and and just that was so much fun getting to do that with Walter. Um, rest his soul as well. Yeah, um, and, and, uh, you know, just getting closer to him and, and, and like connecting like that was really, really fun in the rehearsal process. And, and we didn't use a click. It was just really more organic. And we just played, you know, um, after we had done some rehearsals. So, you know, what a concept, like it felt like it, with other things that I'd been doing, there was never that, that luxury of getting to, actually rehearse before you do a session, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I, it makes a, 
completely different way of, of, you know, you really get your head out of the chart and you really know what's going on and things can happen. You know, at least that's, that's how I feel when I'm, I'm not like buried into a chart or something. Um, and, uh, it was just really great. I remember Larry played bass on one of the tunes too, that, uh, Walter asked him to play. So that, that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, Oh, and you mentioned Lukather. It was it was so great to work with those guys. I, yeah. It was my my first time to to work at Capitol, mm -hmm. um, and we did we did all the drums and, and just um, maybe I came out a couple of times, but it seems like we did it in like three day segments or something, and I would fly out to do a few more with Toto. Um, this was the Toto fourteen album. Um, and it was it was amazing to work with those guys. Unfortunately, we weren't all in a room playing. It was just we did the drums last, um, and then they did some overdubs later. I, I, I think. Um, yeah, but but Same that was way. yeah that was it was great just to just to work with those guys because they they just made so many great records, you yeah. know, and and uh, to work at that studio was incredible. Yeah, um, so that that room A is just in, in, insane. I'm sure you've been there thousands of times because it's time. yeah b is really good for drums too yeah oh yeah okay i've never been in that room but hopefully be, yeah. be down yeah um yeah so that those are two things that i remember it was just just incredible um wow yeah so uh, there's so many so many great ones with you know working with donald and walter that, oh, that come to mind you know yeah oh absolutely uh, how about the, how about the ugly moments? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably got a few of those though. I mean, I mean, oh no, man, you probably don't. I definitely oh, you do. probably don't. I got several. <laughs> no, I can remember. I, I got one. Um, speaking of Steely Dan, I remember this was like first first show of the tour. I don't know what year this was. It's a while back. Yeah. Um, and they had the bright idea of opening the show with Asia. Um. And on one hand, you know, it, I guess it's cool to, to get it out of the way and then I can just kind of settle into some grooves now, you know, <laughs> but, uh, and on another hand, it was, it, it was, uh, it was kind of, you know, nerve wracking to start with a feature, you know, but you know how, how it goes through this whole process, the tune where there's, there's the two feature sections, duets with, the, with sax, yeah. you know, and then. You know, and I was like, "Oh, cool, man!" You know, first gig, first, first show of the tour, and I was, I was feeling good. You know, yeah, this is going cool. And then the last one, where it's just drums, right? The last feature of the song at the end, over the vamp, um, spotlight on me. You know, yeah. and, uh, and so I'm like, "All right, here we go." Bam, boom, bam, stick goes flying out of my hand. <laughs> you know, I'm the spotlight. Every everyone's looking at me. And I'm like doing that left-handed, like random whatever, as I'm like freaking out. And it felt like, <laughs> you know, I'm like doing some combinations here. Okay, wh where's, you know, I'm like grabbing. Usually I'm much faster, but it just felt like eternity was happening. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but you, you know, probably slow came up motion. To the audience where it's like, wow, look at him. He's playing with one hand, man. He's killing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was obvious, man. It was, it was a total, oh man. It was a, it was a horrible like moment, you know, like anyway. <laughs> Hey, so you uh, know what? I, yeah, I I totally hear you, man. But you know, <laughs> I think we we would have had a different perspective. But it's nerve wracking when that stuff happens. That's yeah. I mean, we have to <laughs> laugh with one another because we all had moments like that. I mean, I I don't you know. I just remember. Um, <clears throat> I can't. Uh, I just remember one time, and I can't remember what session it was. Um, it's off the top of my head where. Um, I just went into this session, right? And I'm thinking, and it was it was one of those things that actually informed me and, and and taught me something. And I've said this before. It's nothing new that I think a lot of people don't know, but but you know, it's a risk of re repeating myself. But I remember going into this this session once, and <clears throat> you know, I'm thinking, okay, now I've got some, I've got studio experience under my belt, and you know, oh yeah, I can, you know, I can pull this out of my hat and. And that out of my sort of digital, you know, yeah, okay, I got it, you know. And, um, but oftentimes that doesn't work. And I think that's what taught me to, to sort of go in with an empty slate was that 
you know, I go in at once and I'm thinking, okay, I know what to play. And, um, and the, and the writer was sort of like, no, that's not really what I'm hearing. I'm hearing something. And I'm thinking, okay, um, I really don't know. So the writer wasn't a, really, it wasn't a drummer, but came out and, and tried to sit down on the drums and show me what, what they wanted. And at that point, man, it was another one of those light bulb moments where I just went, holy cow, that's the most perfect part. And I wouldn't have thought of that. I Mm. didn't think of that. How good am I now? I've got all my chops and all my vocabulary and all this and all that. And, you know, a pretty respectable amount of developed instincts at my disposal that I can Mm -hmm. sort of go, oh, yeah, I know what to play. Not so fast. You know, don't be so confident. And that taught me a lot. And, you know, it's interesting because I don't remember what the session was. And I think it could have been another one of those, um, you know, records that didn't see the light of day, uh, which, you know, just unknown artist. But it was it was a huge. um, I mean, I was, you know, I felt kind of like embarrassed. And you know what I mean? I felt like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I went, wow. At the same time, it was like enlightening for me. It was like this whole thing opened up. And, um, and so that was, that was a, a huge, huge, um, I guess an a, epiphany for me, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's and, wow. Uh, yeah. Very yeah. cool. And so, you know, um, so what are we, what are we working on now? What are we doing now? What are we? Hmm. What are we practicing right now? Well, um, I, I, I've been learning how to work pro tools. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know. Um, you know, I, I do, um, I've always felt like I practice on the gig, but since those haven't been happening so much, uh, lately, obviously I, you know, I, I still try to play as much as I can. And as far as anything specific, it's just always learning music for something that's coming up or, or, or a session that I got to learn the music for, so, you know, yeah. do a little prep before I record. I like to, to rehearse the song, kind of get it in my, in my body a little bit, you know, and, and then roll tape. But that's really been it for me right now. And I just try to maintain things by, you know, I'm always playing on a pad um, when I can and just sneak that in whenever I can during the day. But, um, Same here. you know, I, mean, I miss those days of, of, of maybe having that, time and and even the hunger to just do you know hours at a time it's just hard harder you know yeah these, I these know days exactly what you mean and and it's also a thing of where you know you always get people say well you know get outside your comfort zone and uh don't get too comfortable and i'm kind of like i'm seeing two sides of that now hmm. i'm seeing two sides of it where you know if if you're somebody and you confidently have a, a handful of, of vocabulary or things that you play and you make them work all the time, but it forges your identity strongly, then is that, is that a problem? You know, it's right. kind of like, right. There's two, there's a lot of ways to look at it. Right. And you know, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm sort of, but, but at the same time, yeah, I'm with you. I've just sort of just, just been maintaining and, and, and I think that, that there's just enough, for me, it's kind of like, and it's not an excuse, really. It's 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 more like, you know, environmentally, I've been so affected by the things that are going on that that my mindset, um, I think, just from being aware of of the the sort of oh hell kind of moments that we've been in, that that it's kind of affected me, and 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 it's been hard for me to sort of creative my way out of it because for the simple reason that that the way my mind works and what whatever my priorities are is sort of like well this stuff is bigger than me just thinking about flammadiddles you know Mm -hmm. and and it's like if we don't get this stuff together then i might not be able to play flammadiddles you you know it's you know (laughs) i I mean this stuff is more important to me so right the drums is not important but i'm just saying i put things in perspective i'm thinking differently now and um so that's that for, for 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 that that whole thing. But but we want to we want to know and tell. I mean, okay, you know what? I want to talk about my first Gretsch kit. Oh yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> I'll never forget. You know, I <laughs> there was a place in New York called 
professional percussion center. It used to exist in New York. And so, so uh, we used to drive there all the time and get our sticks and, and buy accessories and buy things and stick bags, this, that, and the other thing. And, and um, I remember at that time they were selling sticks were made by this company called Capella. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah, they used to, I remember people. that name. Remember them? Yeah. And they used to make yeah. like, the Joe Jones model professional mm-hmm. percussion center. And, you know, it was, it was like the Elvin Jones model and it was really cool. We bought all the stuff there. So, so, uh, you know, I, I, I was like, Oh, I got to get some Brett's drums, man. So, you know, like Alvin played them and Tony played them, my hero, Tony, you know, and all these people that I loved. And so I saved up some money and I went there and, 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 and the guy who owned it at the time, Frank Lippolito, God rest his soul. He, you know, I walk in there and I said, hi, you know, I want to order these grass drums. And, and at the time it was like people, we were, we were all sort of like, well, we, every, all the drummers and a bunch of other drummers in Boston at that time were playing Gretsch too. And anyway, I became this kind of, oh, I got to get Gretsch drums, right? I love the way they sounded and, and the whole thing. So, but, but what they were doing was modifying them. Look, just get the shells and then you put this, this brand of Tom Mount on and put these spurs on and get this high at stand. And you know what I mean? Right, and, right. So that's what we were doing. We were kind of getting a piecemeal. So I walk in there and I said, look, I, you know, I want to order these drums, man. It, uh, like Tony Williams, Canary Yellow. I want these drums. And he looked at me and he goes, that's a custom color. There's only <laughs> four people that have that in the whole world. Uh, Tony Williams, Elvin Jones, Jan Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Jan Hammer. There's some guy, some guy in Sweden. Or something, you know. And I went, okay, I'm going to be number five. Yeah. Here's my money. Plop. Order the drums. <laughs> and he did. And I had to wait months, you know. Oh, there they are. There Beautiful. They are. Beautiful. And so, so, so Gretsch refurbished the drums for me. And you could see I had a 20-inch bass drum with big tom-toms. And so, you know, and those were the drums that I ended up using uh, when I joined Frank Zappa's band. So, Oh, far out. But, was that- you know, but the thing, <laughs> here's the thing, though. So I buy the drums, and I have to wait. Months go by, and it's like, your drums are here. So our friend, you know, who was my roommate at the time, Kermit Driscoll, bass player, right? Yeah, I love Kermit. But, yeah, great bass player, great guy. We drove, and he had a station wagon, because I just had a little Volkswagen, right? He had a station wagon, and we drove to New York, picked up the drums, and I have them in these cardboard boxes. <laughs> and then and I'm bringing them back in the cardboard boxes, and... Like, I think the next day I played it at, at a friend of mine's senior recital at Berkeley and I'm calling him on the stage and taking him out of boxes. I didn't even have cases for him. I kept putting him back in boxes till the boxes fell apart, you know, <laughs> but, but they were, but, you know, I had, I was proud, you know, I had my drums and, and, uh, and, and, and I loved them and, you know, I still have them to this day. And, and I, I just, I cherish those drums and I can't thank Gretchen enough for uh, bringing them back to their original glory. Were those on any recordings that you with with Zappa or anything like that? You know what? They were on live recordings. Um, okay. Because the studio stuff, of which there were many, of which there were many. So, I mean, I ended up on a ton of records even after I left, you know, because he recorded everything. Uh, but when we had, here's the thing when we recorded Joe's Garage, um, I also, those were Gretz drums, but they were Paul Jameson's Gretz drums. So he, we, we rented them from Paul Jameson and they were these blonde uh, okay. Gretsch drums, the 22 standard sizes, right? And uh, all the toms and everything was standard sizes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you still have them. Do you, do you have yeah. them in storage? Do you play them ever? Or are they just. I, I have them in, st- they're, they're in, in, in a warehouse in cases yeah. carefully locked up. Yeah. And I sort of, um, yeah, I, pu- I pulled them out a couple of times for sessions, but I'm I'm sort of, you know, taking really good care of them and, and right. I'm storing them. Yeah, that's so cool, man. Yeah, you can't beat that color. It's so great. It's a great color, and you know, and, so and the great. other thing is, is you know something people are like, oh, you know, you got all these grass drums, and uh, people think you know, and and when I endorse something, it's like I got to really believe in it, right? Mm-hmm. But but I tell people most of the Gretsch drums that I have many of them i bought them i bought them i have several that i just i bought 
you know? Yeah. And mm-hmm. so, so I plopped my money down for those drums happily, yeah. you know? And yeah, it's, it's like, I don't do things for that reason. If I, I got to, pl- I'm going to play them. I got to want to play them. Right. And, and I get so, it. Yeah. yeah. So that's my great story, you know? Yeah. I think, um, Jules is saying, yeah, you, we have a picture of my first kit too. Um, mine was, ah, oh, there it is. <sighs> my, <laughs> look at I was so, so young. Oh man. Uh, this was a, uh, a walnut. I think it was a 19, early 1980. Um, like the, the, the square badge, I believe, um, that I, I was living in Dallas at the time. Uh, and I found these, they were on sale at a rehearsal space in Dallas that I, I would rent a studio from to practice, you know, and he just said the guy that owned it just had these, uh, I'm not sure where they came from, but I, I'm like, I gotta have them. I always wanted a Gretsch. I always wanted that color. I love the walnut color as well. Um, and, and I just took them and I, and I used them, you know, for years in Dallas playing around town. And then I, I actually, that's the kit that went with me to New York city when I moved to New York in, in 96. And, um, those were actually on the first recordings with Wayne Krantz at the, at the bar when we used to record ourselves live, you know, and then Wayne would put, he would put, actually Greenwich mean was one of the, the records, the first one that I was on that were just compiled from many nights there. And that was the kit that, that I played uh, on those. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing. Like I, I bought them because I, I always wanted that kit and they were the perfect sizes, 10, 12, 14, 16, 20. That was a 20 inch bass drum as well. And um, there's just something about the Gretsch has a class. It's a class act. It's just something about it. All my favorite drummers played them number one and, you know, being a jazz fan and, and, um, listening to Tony and Elvin and, and, uh, and of course you, and, and, you know, so, so many of my favorite drummers play that. And, and then once you witness it, your witness playing them yourselves, then you, you realize there is something really special about them. And it, it's just, there's something that I, I just love about that sound. And I've heard on recordings and I just, you know, there's a feel, there's a certain feel, a, a bounciness that I feel when I play them, when I get the things where I want them. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And of course, the tone is just like unlike anything else. Um, because I like to tune a little bit higher than maybe most. You know, I like that kind of in between bebop and something underneath that, you know, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's just they sound good anywhere. But, you know, to get that that kind of feel thing that I like. The bounciness that that's it's so it's beautiful it really but, is man yeah i know exactly what you're saying yep yeah um but yeah that's that's my first kit and i still have them they're actually upstairs right now great in great. my little in my studio and i've, I've used them on stuff here and there but the, yeah so, i'm gonna i'll never get rid of those oh no exactly yeah. keep them. so so yeah. you got the gretsch hardware with them as well right no no there was no hardware so i, I can't remember what i was using then i must have had DW or something. Yeah. I can sign it too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We all do yeah. that. Yeah. 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 But, but I will say that you don't have to do that anymore. That's the whole, the cool thing, right? It's like I have all Gretsch hardware on my Gretsch drums and they're just, they really, they took it to another level now. And so it's like it, everything is working perfectly as a, as a unit. It's, it's amazing. It's yeah. Very, yeah. It's very, very robust too. So I love it. Yeah, I got to check it out more. I'm still been doing my DW hardware, you know, for the most yeah. part. Yeah, which is great. I, mean, I use those paddles, the DW pedals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, and and so and so the current setup is like, well, you have that at home, and so we should probably talk about what we use now. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I do. You know, like I the drums that I'm using now, I have a couple of different ones. I took this um, one of the old, uh, uh, the older like '90s. Uh, that was uh, my, one of my signature kits. So like, like the Oreo cookie one, right. You know, uh-huh. um, I <laughs> took them to, to Gretsch because I had one of them left and, and, and I said, you know, oh, we're going to do this thing. And, and, uh, <laughs> and Peter Gabriel tour and, and Peter Gabriel's uh, set designer or someone, a production manager, someone in that capacity said, um, you guys are going to have blue instruments and we're going to be another color. So, 
I was like, I got to have blue drums. So, um, you know, I sent him to Gretchen and Paul Cooper just came up with this beautiful color. He sent me a couple of samples and we set her on one. And I said, yeah, it's got to be a nice blue, but a loud blue. And it became cobalt blue. And actually, if I may feel free to disclose this, you know, they gave me the option to sort of name it. And I could, it could have been my namesake color, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I said, no, <laughs> I just call it cobalt blue, you know? And so um, so it became cobalt blue. I think that was the first time uh, that 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 the color may have been been used. In, oh, cool. In, in I didn't realize color that. Color. Yeah, and I think we have pics, pics of that, too. He totally nailed it. Oh, um, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. So I used those on on um, on uh, on that tour. And he, the interesting thing is, is that one of the toms, I think the 18 is new and the snares were new. And, the, and I think the eight is also new, but they match so well because those other drums, the uh, the 1012 and the 14, um, and the bass drum are, are the older Jasper shells, but you can't tell the difference. They, mm. The tone matching is, is perfect. So, yeah, yeah. so that's one that, that I've been using live a lot. And then I have this other kit, which, um, which, which I, which I had wrapped in white nitron and, um, yeah, it's a great sounding kit though. I call them big blue, but these ones that in white nitron, I, I had them because I went to the, oh, the cool. factory, but those are with the, the blue snare drums that are, that have been sort of like my snare drums now that Gretsch did an amazing job with these snare drums. Yeah. Really those are amazing. great snare drums. Oh man. I used one the other day and I can't remember what it was in a studio somewhere. Um, I don't know, United or, or, or Capital. I can't remember where it was. And and I was like, wow, I pulled it out again. I went, whoa, man, I forgot how great this thing sounds. It's just so funky and good tuning range. But but those white drums, the story behind them is that I went to the factory and I saw these shells in the corner. And I said, what are those? They said, those are the last of the virgin stock of Jasper shells. That we have. Mm -hmm. and I went, really? Okay, I'd like one of those, one of those, one of those. And so I, I assembled this this kit and I said to them at the time, I said, this might be the last kit that I that I ever request to be made. Um, so you know, and and then I had them wrapped in in white nitron because I thought, well, what if somebody bumps the shells? I mean, I really got that crazy with it. Um, and and but but it doesn't kill the tone at all. And then I and not you know I I decided that I wanted to try to experiment with the sort of attack and the that whole area of it. Uh, so I took the drums to our friend Chris Hewer over at Hewer's Drum Lab in Burbank, who man Pat is a wizard, right? I said, Chris, yeah. could you please? I'd like to try these with forty five, and he did this sort of forty five. I don't know how he did it on, but. It's, I got the drums back and it was like, holy mackerel, man. It, it was unbelievable what he did. And, and, and in fact, I remember after he, they have so much sustain and punch and everything. Chris is a wizard, this guy. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so, so I took it to, but the first session I took it to was at the late George Duke. May he rest in peace, his house. He had a studio in his house. And I remember Eric Zobel, the engineer came out. I hit the bass drum and he was like, what you gotta gotta figure something out here i'm like what are you talking about he goes there's too much low end coming out of it like 60 <laughs> cycles from hell <laughs> and i went wow you know I, I, hip hoppers would love this one you know <laughs> and so you know it was the first time anybody ever <laughs> said there was yeah exactly no such thing you know? i know right that's yeah. not supposed to be said <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, but but it was funny, you know, because Eric is an amazing engineer, right? So yeah, you know, uh, yeah, but but so you know, but that's like what I use most of the time, uh, almost all the time in the studio now. So, and those are the last of the Jaspers that they had at the factory. Yeah, they're probably like, I mean, those cells are probably I don't know, forty years old or something. You know? Wow, they're like like I think they're like around nineteen eighty mm -hmm. vintage around there or something like that. They've been sitting there. When I went there, they were sitting there for 25 years. I mean, they were, they was just sitting there and they weren't, you know, like just bare shells. Yeah. They went out yeah. of business in like 2000 or something, but these had been sitting there for years. Yeah. You know, so uh, it was, it was really, 
So feedback? We have feedback? Uh, I thought I heard a little bit. Anyway, it's okay. Um, yeah, oh, it's so, a beautiful. So, so that's, yeah, so yeah, that's mine. mine. And, uh, and yours? Um, yeah, um, I'm using, you know, I, I, I've got like a Brooklyn kit that I keep in New York, and I've got a USA kit that was my, my touring kit for a while. Yeah. Um, that is a blue oyster color. I believe that's what it's called. And uh, oh, there it is. That was my tour. Oh, rig. Um, it looks cool. drums, Keith. Yeah. Oh, man. I love those. I have those upstairs right now. I've been recording with those a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah those are great. Um, I use those on the road for a while. And then I now I'm using a, um, uh, a uh, champagne sparkle broadcaster kit. That's my newest one. I don't know. Oh. Do, you, do you have pictures of that, Jules? Maybe not. Um, oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, great, great, and great. So yeah, and I, I got a little crazy and added a third floor tom, you know, in in reference yeah. to Tony. <laughs> yeah, uh, man. And yeah. I got a I got a thirteen on the left. You know, I'd never done that before. So I, so I was just having some fun, you know. Um, sure. So uh, that's that's my newest concoction. I miss Great. those drums. They've, they've been in storage in, in New York this whole time. And if we ever get out again, I'll, I'll see them. <laughs> wow. The plan wow. is to do something in the fall. So I'm hoping it happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I we'll hope see. so too. I think, you know, a lot of people are shooting for the fall. Um, but, 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 or next summer, have, maybe. Yeah. Many have postponed to next, next spring. So just to be safe, but we'll see, you know, I'm yeah. hoping for, hoping for a soft landing, but those are, Beautiful, beautiful drums, man. And uh, ah, yeah, oh. I love them. Man, Champagne Sparkle, man. I remember from back in the day. I mean, when I was a kid, seeing uh, the first time I saw Champagne Sparkle, I can't remember. It was a friend, friend of mine uh, that, that I knew in my hometown had him, and I saw him playing at some some gig outdoors somewhere. And I went, "Wow!" That was the first time I ever saw Champagne Sparkle Gretsch. They were so beautiful, and um, and I think our did, I mean, I'm not sure about this, but didn't at one time Charlie Watts play Champagne Sparkle, Gretsch? May he rest in peace. I'm not sure. Oh, I know. Uh, it was a real shocker um, for me. I mean, I just, I thought, oh, yeah, he's going to get better and we'll see him on the road with the Stones. And I know. Uh, I was wanting to see them this year, too. I was, like, actually going to try to go finally. I've been wanting to yeah. go. Yeah, amazing. I mean, the guy was, like, uh, I saw them about five years ago. Uh, and and it was a, a, incredible. Just Charlie would amazing. I mean, I I could not have imagined myself getting that kind of sound out of what he played. I mean, yeah. I would have probably been, been trying to like overplay. I mean, kind of flat ride. Okay. Yeah. Was, right. 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 Like and you you heard everything. The way he touched you know, is unbelievable. Not you know? hitting hard at all. Right. It just really, no. really but, relaxed. But, it, but yeah, but the sound that he got out of the drums was was you big, know, funky, yeah. yeah, and big. So yeah, may he rest in peace. But um, that, that slinky feel too. <laughs> oh wow, man. Yeah, no, so I mean, great. yeah, no, but nobody. There's only one Charlie, man. Um, but I, yeah, you know, I'm just really, really happy. I'm, I'm really happy that we could do this, and and um, and just it's a great, great way to fellowship and about a lot of things and and learn from each other and and um and just re remind ourselves why we play the instrument that we play and why we play gretch you know that's right yeah yeah totally and that you know this is we, we say this in sincerity i mean i certainly do and i know you do as well and um so so um if there's any kind of um you know things that that we we want to uh you know questions or anything like that or just um I don't know. We can just wrap it, wrap it up with some talk about some promotional things that we might want to mention. Yeah. Okay, well, you might want to um, mention your podcast that is so great. Yeah, you know, I've got this podcast that I do every couple of months, and I'm probably I'm probably going to step up uh, content now. I think a little bit. Um, Breakfast with Vinny. Right? Yeah, Breakfast Dot with com. Vinny. Thank you. And and it's um, you can find it in several places. It's on. Um, a platform that hosts it is called Podbean, uh, which is cool, and uh, and it's on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and it has its own website, uh, www.breakfastwithvinny.com. So so if you do go to Podbean or you go to the website, please uh, sign up 
you know, I'd love to see you uh, subscribe or sign up to it and, and mm -hmm. you know, let me know what you think. So, um, and, and I'm always open to, to new ideas as to what people might want to hear. So it's, I think it's a, it's a fun thing. So. It's it's really great. I got to say, I, I I'm a listener, and and just to get inside your head about how you feel about and think about, um, in general, I think it's it's a lot like your drumming. You it's 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 coming from a very you know, yeah, with lack of a better word, intellectual place. You know, like it's really it's really something, and it's really fun to get inside your head and hear what you think about certain topics. And it's really really fun to listen to. So, Thanks, yeah, dude. check that out. Right on. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, keep them coming. Yeah, thank uh, you. I'll do my best, and 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 you know, please, you know, talk about your. Um, uh, you have a website and and social media things that you that you want to talk about or anything that you want to promote. Yeah. Oh, I, you know what I could show real quick. Yeah. I got a new uh, Gret oh. sig signature snare drum. Oh, that's Wait. beautiful. Oh, this way. It's a it's a brass, and it's like a patina type looking, you know, weathered looking shell. But uh, really proud of it, and uh, it was released this year, and it's it's a five and a half, and which surprisingly there wasn't a five and a half in the USA uh, line, oh. so the, this kind of covers that, which is very cool. Bravo! So man. yeah, check that out. Yes, <laughs> shameless indeed. plug. Indeed, indeed, <laughs> I will. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, but yeah, yeah what, what you're probably on the social media stuff. Yeah, the, yeah, I'm on, I'm on Instagram and 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 Twitter and uh, and Facebook, and I don't, you know, <clears throat> the thing is, is I don't um, deal with Facebook uh, on my own. It's an administrator, so yeah, I don't even know how to work Facebook, you know. So it's strictly for uh, you know professional things. But but yeah, I have those those I'm on on those on those platforms. So yeah, I have my so own I, website uh, vinicaliuda.com as well. So. Yeah. And I'm the same. I have KeithCarlock.com. I've got Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, all the usual suspects. The usual I, suspects. I, yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. use it to, to promote whatever, you know, just because that's the only way to do it these days. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, right? I yes. Know. But that's so. great. So, 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 yeah, I mean, I think that, that we can, we can just wrap this up with thanks and gratitude and, um, and I just want to thank Gretch for having both of us, you know, and, and this was a really, a really fun thing to do. And I hope that, that everybody got something, something out of it. Yeah. Thanks. This has been so much fun. Thanks, Gretch. Thanks everyone at Gretch yes. and Jules and Andrew behind the scenes over there. Yes, sir. But really fun to hang with you, man. It's been too long. Yeah. Same, same, same. So, so um, I'll just, um, yes. This is great. Oh, we have lots, lots of things happening here where we're getting thanks. Oh, that's wonderful. I see it the lower thirds there. <laughs> yeah. This is great. Really, really good. All right. So, um, um, anything else we're missing? I'm just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. I think we're signing off. How do we stop? <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>